In the next three sections, we'll look at the parts of the head and neck that are involved in two vital functions, breathing and eating and drinking. To get a preview of these major topics, we'll look at a specimen that's been divided in the midline. The passage for air and the passage for food and liquid begins separately at the nose and the mouth. Air passes backward through the nasal cavity and the nasopharynx. Food and liquid pass backward through the oral cavity. The two passages unite here. Air, food and liquid all pass through this common passage, the oropharynx. The two passages separate again here in the hypopharynx. Food and liquid pass backward into the esophagus on their way to the stomach. Air passes forward through the larynx and into the trachea on its way to the lungs. So, the lines of travel for air and for food and liquid cross over in the oropharynx. It's important that air on the one hand and food and liquid on the other hand don't pass upward or downward into the wrong passage. To take care of this, there are important mobile structures above and below the oropharynx that act as separators. These are the soft palate above and the epiglottis and vocal cords below. As we'll see in later sections of this tape, the structures that form the passages for air and for food and liquid are also involved in a further important function, the production of voice sounds. In this section, we'll look at the upper part of the air passage. We'll look at the external nose, the nasal cavities, the paranasal sinuses, and the nasopharynx. We'll start by looking at the bony structures that surround these spaces. The bony opening for the nose is called the piriform aperture. Inside it, there are two nasal cavities, a right and a left, separated in the midline by the nasal septum. To get a better look inside, we'll divide the skull in the frontal plane along this line. There's a lot to see here. Let's get ourselves oriented. Here's the hard palate. Here's the floor of the anterior cranial fossa. Here are the medial walls of the orbits. Here are the two nasal cavities. The septum dividing them is a little off-center, which is not unusual. The roof of each cavity, formed by the cribriform plate, is very narrow. The medial wall of each nasal cavity, formed by the septum, is smooth and featureless. So is the floor. By contrast, the lateral wall is marked by a number of features, most notably by these three delicate bony projections, the conchi, also known as the turbinate bones. This is the inferior concha, this is the middle concha, this is the much smaller superior concha. The three conchi partially divide the air passage into three parts, the inferior meatus, the middle meatus, and the superior meatus. Here's the back of the orbital cavity. Below it is the hollow space in the maxilla, the maxillary antrum, which we'll look at later. At about the level of the floor of the orbit, the nasal cavity becomes much narrower. The narrowing is caused by the presence of this collection of small hollow spaces, the ethmoid air cells. We'll see more of these in a minute. To see more of the septum and the nasal cavity, we'll look at it in a skull that's been divided just to the left of the midline. Here's the bony part of the nasal septum. It's formed by this part of the ethmoid bone, the perpendicular plate, and by this small bone that we haven't encountered up till now, the vomer. The lowest part of the septum is formed by the maxilla and by the palatine bone. Here's the divided left cribriform plate. This projection above it is something we've seen before. It's the Christogalli. The frontal section we were looking at was divided here, just behind the Christogalli. Now, we'll remove the septum to get a good look at the lateral wall of the nasal cavity. The roof of the nasal cavity runs along this line, 
rising to its highest point along the length of the cribriform plate. Here are the conchi again, superior, middle, and inferior. There are several openings in the lateral wall of the nasal cavity. They're partly hidden by the conchi. We'll see them in a minute. The lateral wall of the nasal cavity is formed partly by the maxilla, partly by the ethmoid bone, and partly by the perpendicular part of the palatine bone. Further back, where the nasal cavity becomes the nasopharynx, the lateral wall is formed by the medial pterygoid plate. The large facial bones that surround the nasal cavity, the frontal bone, the maxilla, the sphenoid and ethmoid bones are hollow to a greater or lesser extent. The hollow spaces in these bones contain the paranasal sinuses, which in the healthy living body are filled with air. The paranasal sinuses all communicate with the nasal cavity. To see the sinus cavities, we'll look at a skull in which part of the bone that overlies each sinus has been removed. Here's the cavity for the right frontal sinus. There's a left one, too, on the other side of this partition. The frontal sinus extends upward behind the lower part of the forehead and also, to a variable extent, backwards between the roof of the orbit and the floor of the anterior cranial fossa. Here's the cavity for the right maxillary sinus, also known as the maxillary antrum. It extends backwards to the part of the maxilla that borders the pterygomaxillary fissure. It extends downwards almost to the root of the upper molar and premolar teeth. The medial wall of the maxillary sinus is also the lateral wall of the nasal cavity. Its roof forms a large part of the floor of the orbit. The sphenoid sinuses occupy the central part of the sphenoid bone. This opening has been made to show the right sphenoid sinus. To see it better, we'll look at the skull divided in the midline. Here's the right sphenoid sinus again. Above the sphenoid sinus is the floor of the anterior cranial fossa and the cella tersica. Behind it is the basilar part of the occipital bone. In front of it is the high part of the nasal cavity. Below it is the roof of the nasopharynx. Lastly, we'll come round to the front to look at the collection of small cavities that contain the ethmoid air cells, collectively referred to as the ethmoid sinus. These extend from just behind the nasolacrimal duct all the way back along the medial wall of the orbit. As we've seen already, the ethmoid air cells lie between the medial wall of the orbit and the lateral wall of the upper part of the nasal cavity. Before we go further, we need to catch up on something that we left unfinished in the previous section, understanding the ethmoid bone. We've encountered the various parts of the ethmoid bone, but till now we've put off seeing the whole of it. We'll do that now. Then we'll come back and look at the openings of the paranasal sinuses. The ethmoid bone is a fragile coalition of parts. The best way to see all of them is to go back to the skull that was divided in the frontal plane. Now that we've seen the ethmoid bone, we'll return to the cavities for the paranasal sinuses and see how they connect with the nasal cavity. We'll look at the openings for the frontal and maxillary sinuses first. All of this is the ethmoid bone. This part, the perpendicular plate of the ethmoid, forms a large part of the bony nasal septum. This upward projection is the beginning of the crista galli, which rises up in the floor of the anterior cranial fossa. On each side of the crista galli are the cribriform plates, which we've seen already from above and from below. <laughs> 
The most lateral part of the ethmoid bone is this paper-thin layer, the lamina papyracea, which forms this part of the medial wall of the orbit. Between the lamina papyracea and the upper part of the nasal cavity are the ethmoid air cells, as we've seen. The superior and middle conchi are also parts of the ethmoid bone. The ethmoid bone is joined to the frontal bone above, the maxillae below, and the central part of the sphenoid bone behind. Here's the frontal sinus cavity. Here's the maxillary sinus cavity, seen through an artificial opening. The frontal and maxillary sinuses both open in this complex area beneath the middle conker, which we need to look at in more detail. In a dry skull, there are two large irregular openings from the nasal cavity into the maxillary sinus, separated by this flake of bone, the uncinate process. In the living body, all of this opening and much of this one are closed off by soft tissue. The real opening of the maxillary sinus is back here. If we look in from in front, we can see that the opening is quite high on the medial wall of the maxillary antrum. The frontal sinus opens into the nasal cavity by way of a narrow passage, the frontonasal duct. The frontonasal duct starts above the uncinate process and runs upward and forward to reach the frontal sinus. The frontal and maxillary sinuses open into the nasal cavity, not directly, but into a narrow side chamber located here, called the infundibulum. The infundibulum isn't apparent in a bony specimen. We'll see it when we look at the soft tissues. Now we look at the openings for the other sinuses. The sphenoid sinus opens into the nasal cavity here, above and behind the superior concha. The ethmoid air cells, which are up in this region, have several small openings into the nasal cavity. Some of these are behind the middle concha, some of them are below it. There are two more openings to see in the lateral wall of the nasal cavity. The opening for the nasolacrimal duct, or tear duct, and an opening for nerves and blood vessels, the sphenopalatine foramen. As we've seen, the bony passage for the nasolacrimal duct starts here. The nasolacrimal duct, which is quite short, passes downwards and backwards to open beneath the inferior concha. Here's its opening. The last opening to look at, the sphenopalatine foramen, is the inner end of a short tunnel for blood vessels and nerves to the nose and palate. On the inside, it opens near the back of the superior meatus. We'll go all the way round to the outside to see the other end of the sphenopalatine foramen, which is here, in the depths of the pterygomaxillary fissure. Now that we've seen the bony features of the nasal cavity, we'll move back and look at the bones that surround the nasopharynx. Here's the posterior opening of the nasal cavity, the coena, or posterior neris. Its lateral wall is formed by the medial pterygoid plate. The medial pterygoid plate ends below in the hamulus. This piece of colored material represents the cartilage of the auditory tube. The cartilage forms an incomplete tube, open on the underside. Close to the medial end of the cartilage is a group of openings in the base of the cranium that we've seen before from a different angle. The foramen ovale, foramen spinosum, the opening of the carotid canal, and the jugular foramen. The roof of the nasopharynx, formed by the underside of the sphenoid and the basal part of the occipital bone, slopes downward toward the foramen magnum. To complete our picture of the bones around the nasopharynx, we'll add the cervical vertebrae. Here's the anterior arch of the atlas, and here's the odontide process of the axis. Now, 
Let's review what we've seen of the bony structures that surround the upper part of the air passage. Here's the piriform aperture and the nasal septum. Here are the posterior nares or coeni. Here's the inferior concha, the middle concha, and the superior concha. Here are the superior meatus, middle meatus, and inferior meatus. Here's the cavity for the frontal sinus, the maxillary sinus, the sphenoid sinus, and here are the ethmoid air cells. Here are the cribriform plates, the uncinate process, and the vomer. Here are the frontonasal duct, the openings for the maxillary sinus, the sphenoid sinus, and the ethmoid air cells, posterior and anterior. Here are the openings for the nasolacrimal duct and the sphenopalatine foramen. Now that we've looked at the bony features of the nasal cavity, the paranasal sinuses, and the nasopharynx, let's see what this region looks like in the living body. We'll start with the entry to the air passage that forms such a distinctive feature of the face, the external nose. The skin over the upper, bony part of the nasal framework is thin and mobile. The skin over the lower, cartilaginous part is thicker and fixed to the underlying structures. The openings which form the beginning of the air passage are the nostrils, also called the anterior nares. We'll remove the skin from one half of the nose so that we can see the underlying structures. The edge of the bony opening for the nose, the piriform aperture, is here. Here's the nasal bone. The two nasal bones, united in the midline, form the bridge of the nose down to here. From here, almost to the tip, the bridge of the nose is formed by the front edge of the septal cartilage, which we'll see more fully in a minute. On each side, the framework of the nose is formed by two slender pieces of cartilage, the lateral cartilage and the alar cartilage. The lateral cartilage is thin and flat. In front, it's continuous with the septal cartilage. The alar cartilage has two parts, the lateral cross and the medial cross. The lateral cross forms the curved outer framework of the nostril. The medial cross turns sharply backwards, ending here. Together, the two medial crura form the framework of the lowest, most anterior part of the nasal septum, which is called the columella. To get a good look at the nasal septum, we'll divide the bone and soft tissues along this line and remove the left side of the face. Here's the nasal septum. Before we look at it, let's get oriented. Here's the anterior cranial fossa. Here's the bony palate, or hard palate, with the soft palate extending behind it. Here's the oral cavity. Here's the opening of the right nasal cavity. Behind it is the nasopharynx, which we'll look at in a minute. The nasal septum extends from here behind to here in front. This small part of the septum is covered with skin. The rest of it is covered with this layer of mucous membrane. We'll remove a small piece of the mucous membrane so that we can appreciate its thickness. The highest part of the septum is the specialized olfactory area. It contains some of the fibers and nerve endings of the olfactory nerve, which are the sensory receptors for our sense of smell. The cribriform plate, which the olfactory nerve fibers go through, is at this level. Now we'll remove all the mucous membrane from the septum so that we can see the underlying cartilage and bone. This part of the septum is bone, as we've already seen. This part is formed by the septal cartilage. In this specimen, there's an unusual defect in the cartilage here. In front, the septal cartilage forms the bridge of the nose, down to here, 
then runs downward and backward to attach to this bony prominence on the maxilla the anterior nasal spine. Now we'll remove the whole of the nasal septum so that we can see the lateral wall and floor of the nasal cavity. The inside of the nostril, up to the lower border of the lateral cartilage, which is here, is called the nasal vestibule. It's lined with skin. The rest of the nasal cavity is lined with mucous membrane. Here are the conchi, superior, middle, and inferior. The mucous membrane that covers them is richly supplied with mucous glands and with blood vessels. The complex surfaces of the conchi have important functions in humidifying the inspired air and warming it. This olfactory area, like the corresponding area on the septum, contains olfactory nerve fibers and nerve endings. All the paranasal sinuses and the nasolacrimal duct for the tears open into the nasal cavity. To see their openings into the nasal cavity? To see the other sinus cavities, we'll take a look from the outside at a dissection in which all the facial soft tissues have been removed. We'll remove the conchi. The inferior concha was here. Here beneath it is the opening for the nasolacrimal duct. Beneath the middle concha, which was here, is a deep groove called the semilunar hiatus. To see where this leads, we'll retract its lower border with this thread. The semilunar hiatus leads into a narrow, irregular side chamber called the infundibulum. The infundibulum receives the openings of the frontal sinus and the maxillary sinus. Sometimes the more anterior ethmoid air cells open into the infundibulum too. Sometimes, as in this case, they open separately, below the middle concha. Here's where the superior concha was. The more posterior ethmoid air cells open below the superior concha. The sphenoid sinus, which is this cavity, opens forwards into the highest part of the nasal cavity, the sphenoethmoidal recess. Here's the frontal sinus cavity in a different specimen. The opening to the frontonasal duct is behind here. Here's the maxillary sinus cavity opened from in front. The opening from the sinus into the infundibulum is all the way up here on the medial wall. Here are the ethmoid air cells with the lamina papyracea removed. This opening in the medial wall of the orbit also exposes the infundibulum. Now we'll move back and look at the nasopharynx. To do that, we'll put the nasal septum back in place. Here's the right half of the nasopharynx. The openings from the two nasal cavities into the nasopharynx, here's the right one, are called the coeni or posterior nares. The roof of the nasopharynx lies underneath the basilar part of the occipital bone. The back of the nasopharynx lies in front of the atlas vertebra. Here's the anterior arch of the atlas. In the mucosa of the lateral wall of the nasopharynx, there's a pronounced inward fold called the torus tuberius. It's produced by the inward projection of the cartilage of the auditory tube. The mucosal opening of the tube is here. Behind the torus tuberius is a deep recess, the pharyngeal recess. The floor of the nasopharynx is formed by the soft palate, which forms a highly mobile partition between the nasopharynx and the back of the oral cavity. The nasopharynx opens downward into the oropharynx. The soft palate can move upwards, backwards, and downwards. Its movements, which are important in swallowing and in speech, are produced by several small muscles. These converge on the soft palate from above and from below. Most of them insert on a sheet of aponeurosis, or tendon-like material, that occupies this part of the palate. In this section, we'll see only the palatal muscles that come from above. We'll see the ones that come from below in the next section. The two that we'll see now are the levator palati 
and the tensor palatii. To see these muscles, we'll remove the mucosa of the nasopharynx. Here's the end of the cartilage of the auditory tube. Here below it is the levator palatine muscle. Its full name is the levator vili palatini. Levator palatine arises here on the petrous temporal bone. It passes along the underside of the auditory tube, runs downward and medially, and joins in the midline with its fellow from the other side, forming a sling. Levator palatii moves the soft palate upwards and backwards. To see the tensor palatii muscle, we'll remove the levator. Here's tensor palatii. Tensor palatii arises from this area, just above the root of the medial pterygoid plate. Here's the edge of the medial pterygoid plate. The fibres of tensor palatii pass downward and forward towards the pterygoid hamulus, which is here. The tendon of tensor palatii makes a complete 90 degree turn round the pterygoid hamulus. Here's the tendon emerging. It passes medially to insert on the palatal aponeurosis. The action of tensor palatii is to tighten the palate when the tongue presses up against it in the act of swallowing. It also may help to open the auditory tube. We'll end this section with a look at the auditory tube. Here's the end of the cartilage of the auditory tube. The cartilage doesn't form a complete tube. It's open on the underside. Here's the cut edge of the mucous membrane, which forms the real auditory tube. It passes backwards and laterally to reach the cavity of the middle ear. The function of the auditory tube is to keep the pressure inside the middle ear the same as the pressure outside it. Now, let's review what we've seen of the upper part of the air passage. Here are the nostrils, or anterior nares, the columella, the lateral cartilage, the alar cartilage, the septal cartilage, the nasal vestibule, and the olfactory area. Here are the conchi again, superior, middle, and inferior. Here's the nasopharynx, with the torus tuberius, the pharyngeal recess, and the soft palate. Here's the semilunar hiatus, and the infundibulum. Here's the levator palatii, the tensor palatii, and the cartilage of the auditory tube.